Hello, and uh, welcome to this video from Advent Lutheran Church in Lake Ann, Michigan. My name is Tim Jan. I'm the pastor of this congregation, and it is my joy to be able to bring you the preaching text and the sermon for the fifth Sunday of Easter, which is May 15th, 2022. Uh, and we're going to preach from Revelation today. Let's pray together. O oh Lord God, you teach us that without love, our actions gain nothing. Pour into our hearts your most excellent gift of love, that made alive by your Spirit, we may know goodness and peace through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the throne of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. And the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. When you think about the book of Revelation, what words come to mind? Maybe fear, war, violence, destruction, cults, confusion, secret codes. Christians have too often misused the book of Revelation in so many terrible ways. So for many centuries, even uh, bringing it up tends to come with a lot of baggage. When Martin Luther first translated the Bible into his native language of German, he thought that Revelation was somewhat edifying. It had some good points, but it shouldn't be given the same status as the Gospels and the other letters in the New Testament. So he put it last, almost like an epilogue. Revelation is written by John, who is a pastor towards the end of the first century for seven churches. He writes this letter for seven churches in what's now Turkey. It's an apocalypse. An apocalypse is a genre of literature from that time. Apocalypse means revealing. And it's known for dreamlike visions. And many of them can be frightening. But there are other apocalyptic books in the Bible. The book of Daniel, for instance. The point of the book of Revelation is not to frighten, but rather it's meant to give hope from God to people who in that time feel like their world is coming apart at the seams. You have to start at the ending. What I just read to you about the new heaven and the new earth in order to understand that. If you start at the ending, you realize where we're headed. Jesus says, see, I am making all things new. No matter how bad things seem right now, that is where we are all headed. I think it's time to reclaim the book of Revelation as a book of good news. So without further ado, I think the uh, Apostle John, who writes this letter, uh, really likes the uh, number seven. So I'm going to give you really quickly seven pieces of good news. 
from the book of Revelation. Number one, Jesus is still speaking. Revelation was written down about 60 years or so after Jesus' resurrection. He ascended up into heaven, so he wasn't physically present with his followers anymore. And he promises that he's going to send the Holy Spirit and that Jesus will be with them wherever two or more are gathered in his name. And sure enough, after two generations, Revelation starts off with Jesus himself coming to John in a vision and sharing seven practical messages to specific congregations about how to stay faithful even when times get tough. This should bring us all hope. Just as God spoke to individual congregations at that time, God can speak to individual congregations in our time too. Even if Jesus doesn't speak to us in grand visions like he did in, to John, he does speak to us whenever we gather around God's word and whenever we talk about it together. God's word is not some ancient book only about the past, but it has implications for our lives every day. It's alive. It is something that happens to us every time we hear it. It happens right here and right now, and it says something different to us hearing it today than it did last week, than it will next week or next year. It's new every morning, so Jesus is still speaking. Number two, worship is life. You would be amazed if you read through the book of Revelation, how many of the verses that you recognize because Christians have been singing them in worship services for 2,000 years. How about this one from Revelation 4? Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. How about this one? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Those are both parts of our liturgy that we sing every week. In Revelation, every time God pulls back the curtain and shows us what's happening in heaven, it turns out to us, it looks like there's a worship service going on. That doesn't mean that all that we'll do after we die is sit in a pew and go to church. I know a lot of people for whom that would not feel like heaven at all. But it does mean that there is a dimension of existence now, traditionally what we think of as heaven, that is just simply in tune with God and with God's will at all times. There are beings that inhabit that dimension. We might call them angels. And when we gather for worship together, wherever we are, however we gather, it's like opening up a curtain into a dark house on a sunny day. We are not turning on the lights of heaven on Sunday mornings. The lights are already on. The lights are there. We're just, we're not starting up the music. The music of heaven is going on all the time. We're just briefly joining in. What we're doing is opening up the curtain and remembering that we can walk out into the sunlight anytime we want. We should live our lives out into the sunlight as much as we can and that our lives are an act of worship. Number three, lamb power over lion power. I talked a little bit about this last Sunday and you can refer to that, but Instead of showing up in brute force, like a big scary lion, Jesus shows up in John's vision as a Passover lamb who has been slaughtered, who has sacrificed himself. That's the nature of the cross, and it's the nature of Jesus' nonviolent way of leading. Never at any point in Revelation does God ever call upon God's people to take up arms against evil Or to do violence of any kind. That's not the way that Jesus led us on earth. And it's not how he leads us from heaven either. There is violence and destruction in the book of Revelation. There are scary moments. But it's almost always as a symbol of humans stubbornness. And things that we are already kind of doing to ourselves in the current time. The lamb takes all of that violence and sin into himself 
and at the end renews all things. That's lamb power. Number four, to quote Lin-Manuel Miranda, oceans rise, empires fall. As a strange of a book as the book of Revelation is, it is also by far the most political and the most critical of the Roman Empire of the first century. Back then, you didn't have any freedom of speech, so you had to be really careful what you say. If you disagreed with the emperor, you couldn't just tweet about it. So John uses some coded language. There are some codes in the book of Revelation, but they're pretty easy to decode if you know history. So, for instance, the mark of the beast, they talk about 666. Well, that was a coded reference in numerical language to the emperor Nero. Chapter 17 actually says the seven heads of the evil beast are seven mountains. Guess what city is famously built on seven hills? That would be Rome. Chapter 21 has this strange line about the sea being no more. But this isn't about marine life becoming extinct. It's more hopeful than that. It's actually about the system of commerce that was exploiting people and transporting slaves. And this all happens on the sea. And at the end, God puts a stop to it. God puts the end to the exploitive commerce that comes from the sea. Time after time, when you dig just a little bit, you find John talking a lot more about what's happening in his own world than in ours. Yet the vision itself is timeless. I love this quote from Martin Luther King. The day before he dies, he says, It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem, but one day God's preacher must talk about the new New York, the new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, the new Memphis, Tennessee. This is what we have to do. Revelation reminds us that because no empire lasts forever, because empires fall, then God's people can dream every day about how to renew our communities, no matter how far-fetched no matter how far-fetched those dreams seem, no matter how gridlocked all of our systems of leadership seem to be, we can dream about renewal from God in our communities. Because the days of earthly empires are, numbers, we are numbered, we can do our best for justice in our own generation, just as Dr. King did. Number five, the body counts. I'm not saying the body count. We're not talking about an action movie here. The body, our bodies count for something in God's final plan. Our bodies count and our planet counts. Each Easter, we remember that Jesus didn't just go escape his body to go to heaven. God raised his body new. That's why it's so vitally important to the early Christian believers that Jesus' tomb was empty. He didn't leave a body there. Sure enough, at the very end of time in John's vision, we see God creating not just a new heaven, but a new earth. In the end, we don't escape our bodies, and we don't escape this planet. God makes the whole thing new the way it was always meant to be from the beginning of time. And heaven and earth are no longer separate places because God lives with us here and now. Which brings me to number six. Heaven comes down. Dr. Barbara Rossing says of the book of Revelation, there is no rapture in the story of Revelation. No snatching of people off to the earth, to, off of the earth to go to heaven. Look at it this way. It is God who is raptured down to earth to take residence and dwell with us all. A rapture in reverse. This to me seems like an actual visible picture of the grace of God. Heaven coming down. 
We spend our whole lives trying to climb up out of our sins to be good enough, to build some kind of ladder by doing all the right things for God. But there's no point because we can't get up there. We keep slipping. And that's why God is coming down. We are forgiven of our sins. Our debt is already paid. There's nothing more to do but trust that God comes down to us. So number seven, and finally, God is in control. From the beginning to the end of Revelation, God controls the process. God initiates every stage. There's some confusing imagery. There's a lot of poetry in the book of Revelation, but the actor in all of it is the same. If there's a seal, God's the one to open it. If there's a trumpet, God's angels are the ones to blow it on God's command. If there's bowls, God pours them out. There is not one button that God does not push, not one T crossed or I dotted in this plan that God does not personally handle. Another civil rights icon, the Reverend Ralph Abernathy said, I don't know what the future may hold, but I know who holds the future. And that, in a nutshell, is the whole point of the book of Revelation. And really, it's the whole point of the Bible as a whole. God holds the future, our future, the planet's future, the future of the cosmos. Do we have free will to mess things up in the meantime? Absolutely we do. Too often, those are the chase choices that we make. But in the end, can we change God's mind about coming down to dwell with us? Nope, that's going to happen. Can we change God's ability to renew the creation? No way. That began on the cross. It continued on Easter morning, and it will continue until we are dwelling with God here on earth and heaven and earth are together again. God is going to get it done. So when you think of Revelation, what words come to mind? Well, I hope after today, good news is among them. Amen.